Welcome, Chris, to What If I Say Yes, my new YouTube channel. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because I think you are the first interviewee who's also an interviewer. Oh, well, well don't be nervous because I'm nervous too. We can be nervous together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so even though you are... Um, I would love to make a lovely introduction, introduction um, to present you to my audience, but you are an expert in that. I've heard your podcast and your, your introductions to people are lovely. So I'm going to ask you now to introduce yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm Chris Holmes, and I am a professor at Ithaca College of World Literature. And I live in Ithaca, New York, with my family, my wife and my two sons, where we've lived for about 11 years now. Okay. Um, now let's talk about how we know each other. So I think we, we know each other uh, via your husband who yes. uh, is the office next door to mine and who I, I think I met your daughter before I met you because she's so lovely and comes to visit and will pop in all the offices along that row. Um, and then I forget when we, the first time we met in person, um, do you remember? No, but it must have been very early. We arrived in the summer of 2013. Okay. So maybe that fall semester, I'm sure we, we yeah. met. Probably at some like silly college luncheon or something like that with <laughs> all the families invited. Um, but you have, um, you know, through your own podcast and, and through our conversations about both our podcasts have become a great um conversation partner for what exactly this this medium means and and what we can do with it and and how it's a good way maybe to to reach out to people sort of far and wide yes true 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 so as you know i started this um i started with a website what if i say yes dot com um inspired by an idea that my late brother Hector developed in 2005. And then later I thought, well, what if I say yes to creating a podcast? And so I created a podcast. And my latest what if I say yes was, what if I say yes to creating a YouTube channel? Kind of combining my love for interviews, my curiosity. Um, I'm always asking people questions about their lives and the whys and the hows and the whens. Um, combining that with this idea of, well, what if I can talk to people about their moments of what if I say yes? And so you're my sixth inter interview. The previous five, I decided that I, I was going to ask them at the moment of the interview. So I, I, I just told them, before I interview, you just have to think of a moment when you said yes, and we're, we're going to talk about it. But I didn't want to know anything about it until I interviewed them live. With you, I had a specific concern, not concern, a specific question. I really, really, really wanted to know how, why, when you have said yes to creating your podcast. So take us through uh, the journey of when you had the idea, why you had the idea, what has happened, et cetera. Okay. So I, um, I am the creator and host of a podcast, a literary interview podcast called Burned by Books. 
And it started very much with a say yes moment in the, well, not the middle, in the, in the scary, scary beginning of COVID. And it happened uh, maybe two months into the full lockdown of the country and the world and all of our schools and colleges. And I had been sitting at home um, while my wife, who's a, who's a doctor, was treating COVID patients all the time. Um, and her life and, and therefore our family's life was very, very difficult and scary and constantly wondering if she was going to be struck ill with COVID and, and what our kids get COVID. And so the, everything was about no. It was about don't see other people and don't have contact with mom when she gets back from, from the office or the hospital and don't see your friends, only see them on Zoom. And so when I was probably at the, the deepest level of my sadness about all of this, books were an incredible company for me. They always have been my whole life. And so the idea that I could take comfort in, in reading a book became more and more important and being able to fling myself into another world. But at a certain point, you're desperate for human connection. You're desperate for um, a sense that there's someone else besides you and, and a book. And, and obviously, you know, my family was around me a lot, but I, I needed something more. And the idea came to me that a, that a podcast where I talk to authors about their books would be this wonderful add-on to reading. It would make reading grow. And then I could see how the authors had been inspired, what their works meant to them when they were writing them. And then now see how they were dealing with COVID, especially at the beginning, the people I were talking to were also inside and, and they were often very sad. And, and, and so that kind of became the genesis of what the podcast would be. And when I found out that it's actually quite cheap to be able to run a podcast and doesn't take a lot of, uh, of money to have a, a microphone and, and, and get some free recording software, then it was easier to say yes, to be able to convince myself that I could do it. But it, at the beginning, it was really just asking my friend, Eleanor Henderson, who happens to be a wonderful novelist and memoirist, whether she would come on and be a guest. And I'm glad she was my friend and not someone who was a stranger because it took us probably 15 times to get, a, uh, to get the audio to work. For whatever reason, I could not get the audio to function and it sounded weird on both our ends. And, and she was so nice and so kind about it, even though I was just failing miserably. Uh, and, and ultimately we got an episode out there. And because Eleanor knows everyone in the book world, she was able to early on say, oh, talk to this person. They'd probably come on a, a, you know, an unknown podcaster's uh, show and and so it sort of grew from there but it was about being lonely it was about wanting to uh, be connected outside of my very small world at the time and it really did that it brought me a great deal of happiness and even when the show was very very small I mean my early kind of data on it was that about between 10 and 15 people were listening to each episode. And, but that, you know, that was okay. That was 10 or 15 people that I didn't, wasn't talking to before that. So that mm -hmm. was my, my say yes to it. Um, so 10 new people and those 10 people were your family and friends or were actually people who didn't know you? Well, it, it really did start just family and friends and, <laughs> you know, friends of friends. But then, you know, the interesting thing was it was a friend uh, who had a friend who was a librarian, who was sort of the first person who was maybe that connection point that started mm -hmm. to kind of grow things a little bit. And she, you know, liked to hear these conversations with authors and wanted to share them with people. And so she shared them and she had a big, wide group of librarian um, friends who became mm -hmm. 
And librarians are the greatest advocates for books anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so once you have librarian listeners, you've got a you've got a real audience after that. And so uh, the librarians sort of helped me grow things. And then you know the one of the new joys was to see kind of looking at kind of analytics that you can get re really easily on any mm -hmm. of these programs that people in other countries were listening. And that um, started to be very exciting to me because I wanted to um, have a, a broader dialogue about these books. And, and many of the books weren't you know, necessarily by Americans or you know, some of them weren't even written in English. And so when I uh, interviewed uh, a Chilean author early on, Alia Trabuco Zeran, she um, has a has a massive following in Chile. So all of a sudden I had a lot of Chilean listeners, which felt mm -hmm. really wonderful. And I and even though I couldn't see them and they weren't talking directly to me, I felt like we were we were in conversation with each other. Nice. Before I ask you about the process, um, once you decide to say yes to creating a podcast. So then the first thing you do is what? You buy a microphone, You what, what is it like? The specific things you did to start before the interview with Eleanor. So I looked on, there are just, as you would imagine with the internet, there are 80 million sites on how to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. And they all said different things. So it was actually quite difficult to figure out like who to pay attention to. And, <laughs> and I knew I needed a microphone. And mm -hmm. so I actually went on eBay and I bought an, um, a nicer microphone, but used, it used, but in perfectly good working condition. And it cost $50 on eBay. And I think it was normally maybe a, a $200 microphone. So you, you have to get a, a microphone and you should probably get a, you know, a decent one if audio is your only medium, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're just, people aren't going to appreciate the sound of it. And then, you know, it was about finding, you know, some software that would help me with editing. And, and that was the scariest part for me, because I knew I could get somebody on the line and have a conversation with them. That didn't seem too scary. Mm -hmm. But it was, what am I going to do with this raw sound that I have? How am I going to make it something that actually tells a story or is interesting to other people? And so I found a podcast software that's an online software rather than a hardware that allows that they do some of the editing. So they kind of level everybody's sound and make it, you know, some of the background noise go away, but then they make the actual editing process very easy. And so I can go through and just take out, you know, ums and ahs and, and things that I, I don't want to exist in the, in the conversation or, or slim, slim down answers or questions. And I can edit something in two hours. Whereas if I was doing more sophisticated editing, it would probably take me, you know, three or four or five. Mm -hmm. So having, knowing that I could record an, es an episode and then edit it and not completely devour my, all my free time and life, mm -hmm. that again made saying yes, a possibility. Because if I was thinking about, oh, I'll never have any free time because I'll always be editing podcast episodes, that's, that's a harder yes, I think. So that was the process. And then once I had those things, um, then I had to, had to start to think about what a structure would be like, because there are so many different genres of, of podcast and, and you know, web-based in, interview or conversation shows. Mm -hmm. so it, you know, it evolved along the way. I started and I had kind of long book reviews of my own and book recommendations that I did you know, that I would write, you know, three pages of, of notes on, on reviews of books, and then I would have the interview, and then mm -hmm. I would end up. But over time, it became, because I was doing more and more interviews, and I was really more interested in the interview rather than my um, recommendation thoughts, I then kind of X'd that out and sort of slimmed down everything so mm -hmm. that it was just making an interview. I do an introduction to the author and, and their book, and then mm -hmm. we have the interview, and then I close it out. Did you, how, 
how much time or when did you decide how much time your podcast needed to be? How long, not how much time, how long it needed to be? That's a great question because it definitely evolved over the period of you know the podcast so far. When I started, I didn't have any length, and I was and I thought, however long the episode is, that's how long it, it will be. And so <laughs> early episodes are an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you, as I talked to other people who did podcasts podcasts and also noticing the podcasts that I listen to mm -hmm. it is very rare for something to go over an hour mm -hmm. and and even at an hour what I was realizing looking at you can see in your analytics how long people listen for mm -hmm. and what parts they listen to and I was realizing nobody was listening after about 45 minutes and and that's fair people have lives and things to do and they want mm -hmm. maybe something a little bit more compact mm -hmm. and so now i aim for something between 35 and 45 minutes okay. and it's fine if it ends up spilling over if it's a really great or expansive interview that's okay with me but i realize that if my listeners probably regular listeners and new listeners want something in that 35 to 45 minute range okay now, the process. I'm super curious because I've heard several of your episodes and love them all. But I notice, so the first thing I notice is that almost everyone you interview is delighted after you read an introduction about themselves and about their work. So I, I wanna know how you structure and how you think about um, introducing an author to your listeners. But the other thing that I've noticed is that you're so, it looks like you read their books with so much love and so much attention that every single question you ask almost make them giddy. Like they, they get these questions that they don't get usually from people who interview them about their books. And I love that because it's very rare um, to find or to see them, to see the authors kind of surprised about a question that makes them think about their own work in ways they didn't think about, or you ask questions that they have been wanting to answer, but nobody has asked them. So I, I want to know what you do to prepare for your interviews. Well, first of all, thank you for, for all those kind things. Um, I'm very, I'm flattered. And when I, you know, the nice thing about the, the show that I do is it's books that I have read and liked and therefore pursue the author. And so I never have to worry that I'm going to read a book and think, oh, this is kind of, this is a little so-so, or I don't love it. That doesn't mean there isn't a range within the people I, I interview of their books, things I love and things I love maybe a little bit less, but I like all of them and admire things about all of them. And that's really important for me because I feel like that the our conversation can start with I admire this thing that you have made. You've made this artwork, I admire it, and now we can have a, a conversation. Rather than them thinking of me as, as a critic who, mm -hmm. who may sort of, you know, find great deficits in, in the work and, you know, secretly be asking questions, but really not like it. They know I like it. I've sort of mm -hmm. sought them out. And that makes writing an introduction to the work a lot easier. And that is that is what I spend the most time doing. You know, it takes a it takes a couple of hours to write a even a short uh, introduction that I like, and I feel like does justice to what the book is is I think trying to do. Mm -hmm. And if I can get a if I can get my head around what I think the book is trying to do, then I can write something that I feel like gives that to the audience in a way that's digestible and clear and, and mm -hmm. shows what, what they would like best about the book. And that way, I don't have to do book recommendations anymore because my introduction is in a sense a book recommendation. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, the questions that I ask, I actually try never to look at other interviews of mm -hmm. the author because I feel like then I'll be worried about Am I overlapping with that other interview? Um, am I too influenced in reading the book a certain way by another interview? So I don't know. It may be that I overlap lots with other interviews, but this way I feel I come to it fresh. I, mm -hmm. And then I can write a series of questions. I always aim for somewhere about eight questions. For whatever reason, eight questions lasts about, you know, 35 or 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. My questions are really a version of how I would talk with my students about a book. So, and, and I think maybe that's what makes the, the show a little bit different than some other interview podcasts, because I come at it like a, you know, a teacher of literature. And I say, you know, what are the key things that I would want to talk to my students about with this book? How would I get them to respond to the book with me? And then I change it to kind of incorporate and pull in the author. The only thing that's weird about that is that literary criticism and, you know, teachers who are professors of literature for really about 50 years have sort of tried to consider the author like dead and, and somewhere <laughs> else. You don't mm -hmm. need to consider the author. It's just the work. And obviously the show throws that away and said, mm -hmm. we care about the author. We care about the process and the craft and, and, and how they feel the book mm -hmm. works. And sometimes I'll, I'll say something and I'll, um, you know, I've had a number of interviews where I, I pose a question and I say, why, why did you want this to happen in, in the book? And they'll say, is that happening? I didn't know. I didn't know that was happening. Andrea <laughs> Barrett, who's a, who's an author that I've loved for years and years and years. And it was a real honor to get to talk with her. But I think the nice thing about our conversation was that I saw things going on in their work that she hadn't intended and that mm -hmm. she liked. She said, I don't know that I put that in there, but I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, now, um, how do you decide who to interview? And is part of your job trying to balance how many male authors or female authors or non-binary authors you interview, um, where, which countries they come from or which languages they write their original work in? Is, is that something you take into account? Yeah, now it is. When I started, because it was sort of a catch as catch can thing where I would take anybody who would talk to me who I had read their book and liked it, that, you know, I really didn't have any determining factors other than my my reading habits. Mm -hmm. But as the podcast has grown, I feel committed to a number of things. I feel committed to having authors on who can have a conversation in English, but who did not write their book in English. And, and right now that's principally been been authors who write in Spanish and and then come on and, and they speak with me in English. But we we talk about translation, which is I know something very, very important to you and, mm -hmm. and interesting to you. And it's very interesting to me. And so I'm I'm very committed to that. I'm uh, more and more committed to having um, what I hope will be a majority of writers of color as my as my guests, because the publishing industry is not catching up to the rest of the world quick enough on this. And, and it's still the case that even books of monumental importance get less um, press if they are writers of color. And that's for lots of reasons, not, not simply understood reasons, but you know, many, many reasons coming together in a nexus that make it so that they just don't often get the press they should. For example, I interviewed Percival Everett, who has written 30 or 40 novels, all of them pretty much sort of widely critically praised. He is taught widely across universities. Mm -hmm. He's considered by many one of the deans of American literature. But his books, even though they're, you know, they're nominated for the Booker Prize and the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, 
they're not selling at the numbers of of books by white authors who are of the same or lesser uh, notoriety in the mm -hmm. literary world. So I'm I'm sort of trying to shift the podcast to have ultimately a majority minority guest list. That will take some time and and kind of more effort and searching in my um, on my part because it's still the case that publishers the big splashy books that they're putting out a lot of them are white authors um and so it's it'll take some time but i'm i'm very committed to that there's places where the podcast has sort of failed representationally and that's i'm i'm thinking of one of my guests uh who i who i really admire in terms of her ad advocacy for these kinds of books her name is ursula uh via real mora and she talks about how if you're not reading indigenous authors you're not you're not looking and you need to be mm -hmm. looking. and and i i am not doing the looking yet and so um you know i'm going to start to kind of look for and bring on indigenous authors and then you know thinking about where uh you know lgbtq plus non-binary authors can can come in more strongly into my guest list but so those things are all on my mind now in a way that they weren't and, and really couldn't be at the very beginning but my authors are chosen now in a sort of like dual process and one is that major publishers and smaller publishers reach out a lot now which is very exciting and very fun. Uh, and but it's very easy to be become the the de facto podcast for Penguin Random House because they'll say, interview this person, interview this person. They're great. <laughs> and and they send me books. And so I say, oh, well, they must be great. And I'll I'll read and interview them. But there's so much variety in small presses and, and other places. And so I also have to just keep reading on my own and seeking out books that way. And then having a sort of dual process of having publishers kind of, you know, give me a heads up that they're, they think I'd like a certain author, and then just be reading on my own. Let's talk about numbers now. How many episodes have you published so far, do you know? I think it's close to 80. It's okay. like, in the, I think it's in the 70s, approaching 80. I could be wrong, but I, I think that's right. Your audience has grown from 10 originally to, do you know how many overall? Just about 100,000 downloads this year. Uh, and so I don't know what it is over the th the two and a half years or two and three quarters, but it was 90, 96,000 some downloads this this calendar year. And then countries. You started with only you, the USA, and then now, um, all all over the place. Very unexpected, you know, listenerships, including the Vatican. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm very interested to know who's who the listener is from the Vatican. But I have a, I'd say I have an established listenership in in Chile, in um, Argentina, Brazil. And then in the UK, I have a lot of listeners. That's second to, to the US, Canada, Germany, France, and then a, then a smattering of a few listeners. The One of the really fun things at the beginning of this year was when, you know, something on my analytics shows me sort of charts of book podcasts and where you sort of fit in those things. And for a very brief time, maybe two days, I was the 13th most popular books podcast in Denmark, which uh, was, I don't know why I, I was tickled by this. And I don't, you know, I don't have any direct friends in Denmark. And I even, <laughs> I even reached out on my episode and I said, whoever is listening in, in Denmark, you know, please reach out and I'll I'll send you a T-shirt for the podcast. And no one ever did. So <laughs> I don't know. If I, it was only two days that a uh -huh. ton of people listened and then they never listened again. But <laughs> interesting to know. Um, I haven't asked you why burned by books 
how did you come up with the the name of your podcast so there's a poem that i love by by stephen dunn and it's a poem called to my um to my obituary writer in advance I think that's the title. I might be getting that wrong, but mm -hmm. it is, it's a poem and it has a, a line that says, I was burned by books early and I kept sidling up to the flames. And I just loved that idea that, you know, as a reader, especially as a young reader, that you would be kind of on fire with, with your, the way you're reading or the way you encountered a book or were just in, enveloped in it. And I thought that might be a, a fun name for the for the podcast. I don't know if I am breaking any copyrights by having Stephen Dunn's <laughs> mind there, but um, no one has reached out yet to say so. Hopefully not. <laughs> Have you been burned by books since you were a kid? Very much, yeah. Uh, I was um, early, early on. I had a very funny and non-literary beginning to my to my reading life, which was, did, did you ever watch the movie Gremlins? No. It's it's a kind of culty monster movie. And okay. uh, my mom bought me the novelization of the movie Gremlins. So mm -hmm. not even, it didn't start with a novel and then become a movie. It was a movie. And then they hired someone to write a, a, a novel based on the movie. So that was the first book that I can remember being utterly engrossed in and just sort of losing all track of time. I mean, it's probably the least literary book ever written. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure if I read it today, I would be horribly just embarrassed that that was it. But, you know, that and choose your own adventure novels. And do you- But do wait, you... wait, wait, the novelization of the Gremlins, how old were you? I was probably- Eight years old, maybe. Okay. Do you remember you your first your first book that you really were burnt by? If we're using that um, term, um, no, I have a very um a very complicated relationship with books because I saw my father reading every time he had free time, reading constantly, reading big books, short books. Um, and then I saw my sister getting that same love for books. And she would be like, my dad would buy an entire collection of 12, 12 um, volumes. And she would read them one by one. Um, like just, she would just go into that world. And it was fascinating to me to just see them doing that. But I couldn't do it. So um, I remember there was a little book, and I think it was in English. So I must have been older, um, that had a character named Lucy. And it was it was little, and when I finished it, I, I felt very proud. Then I also remember a bit my my first big novel about Nicolas and Alejandra. Um, and I think it took me a year to finish it. <laughs> but when I finished it, I was very proud of myself. So my love for books has evolved. To the point that now I don't, and I, I, I also grew up listening to my uh, maternal grandmother saying, once you start a book, whether you like it or not, you have to finish it. So I had these very um, competing stories about books. So you, I was looking at my dad and my sister reading just for the love of it. But I also had this very disciplined idea from my grandmother that once you open a book, you have to commit to it. Mm. And I sometimes didn't like the books. <laughs> so it's, it's 
um, taken me many, many years to come with, to, come, um, to arrive to the idea that I can start a book and then start another, um, read at the same time. So I have one, two or three books open, finish them in my own time, not finish them if I don't like them. But that, that took me a long, long time. So, but I don't have that, that one book <laughs> that you had at eight years old. <laughs> I love that story though, because it's, I, I feel like there are many people who have a complicated relationship with books and that they may come to love them much, much later. And there's, you know, you always hear about stories about kids who sort of dive in early on. But that's not, I don't think that's the average story. I think people have complicated relationships to them. And now there's also audiobooks. So people who can't, who are very restless and can't read and they, um, it's not necessarily the case with Maya, but Maya told me a few days ago that she prefers when I read to her mm -hmm. than when she has to read on her own. And that also has to do with, I guess, being in community, like sharing the same story. Mm -hmm. um, one summer, we actually had, so I have a friend, Victoria, who's also a lover. She was a librarian. She's a lover of books. Um, and we chose a book. It was a series. I think it has three, four. No, I don't remember. Three or four books. Um, and we we read them together. So Victoria would read in at home. Maya and I would read together, and then we would comment um, on what we had read. And then at the end, because this was this must have been at the end of COVID, we had a Zoom session to talk about the last book and the ending of the last book. And that was lovely. Maya loved it. <laughs> That's so nice. Um, I have another question for you. You have a favorite author that you mention in your podcast. How do you say his name? Kazuo Ishiguro. Have you, you haven't interviewed him, right? Have you tried? I have, yeah. And? Well, so I'm, I'm finishing a book about him. It's uh -huh. a book about Ishiguro. And as part of the proposal for the book, I floated to the publisher the idea that they could help me get him on the podcast. And then I would, at the end of the book, I'd have a transcript of our interview. And I guess he has a policy where he doesn't do any he doesn't do any kind of um, podcast interview. I mean, he has done things like Terry Gross, uh, Fresh Air, and, and some of the kind of, you know, astronomically important ones. But otherwise, he doesn't do any of those interviews. And he said he has fully stopped participating in academic kind of book discourse about him. So early on, you know, maybe in the early 90s, there are a couple of great interviews with him that are in books about his his work, but he feels like, and, and I respect this, he feels like he wants the work to be able to live on its own and not too much shaped by his ideas about it. And he's such an important author, you know, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature and the Booker Prize twice. And, you know, it's, it, it's, I think important for him that the that the work live without him being the voice that shapes how we read it. But it was pretty devastating to me. I thought I had a good chance at that mm -hmm. point. I had interviewed a couple of bigger name sort of world literature figures, and I thought maybe he he would listen to one and he would think, oh, this will this will be good, and we'll have a nice conversation. And this is someone who knows my work well, but. He said no, and it and I don't think there's an there wasn't a window that I oh I could ask him later if the if the podcast got bigger. So I'm sad, but I also I respect how much and how seriously he thinks about the future of his his work. Does he live in the UK? Yes, he does. Yeah. So asking the people who listen to you in the UK to convince him. <laughs> 
I wish. I it's wish. Not an, uh, an option. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I would do a lot of things to to be able to get an interview with him. He's been very important to my both my reading life and my professional life. And so there's a lot of bridges that I would try and get across on my hands and knees to to get to an interview with him, but it doesn't look positive. <laughs> Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed because that would be the most lovely interview in the world. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I would probably be so nervous that I, it would be good that there was no visual because I would just be <laughs> sweating and red faced. And so maybe, maybe there's a good side to not interviewing him. Which leads me to another question that I have for you. When you interview people, is it through Zoom? It, no, it's through uh, a a podcast software called Alitu. Ah, and, so there's and, no video at all of no any of your video. interviews? Nope. And I find that easier for me because I often have a lot of papers and the book in front of me, which I'm kind of moving around and I'm looking at while I'm doing it. And I feel like that that when I can see myself or when they can see me, then I'm distracted or I think I'm distracting them because I'm, even though I'm listening very carefully, I often have to like look for cues for other mm. questions and things. You do it seamlessly, so I, I i mean, maybe it's just that I'm bad with visual things, but <laughs> I found it i found it easier to do it just in audio. Okay, it makes sense. Um, I'm checking the time because I don't want to go over um, the hour that I promised you. What have you learned from, well, two questions that I have right now. One is, um, at what point, what was the tipping point? Is, is that, I don't know if that, that expression is correct yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. When your podcast became, went from just family and friends listening to, wow, now it's, it's becoming a thing. That's one question. And the other one is, um, what have you learned from doing this podcast? I've learned a lot, uh, but in terms of the the tipping point for the podcast, it was two things, and and one of them was the uh, the sort of fame and kindness of a couple of of authors, including Jennifer Egan, who wrote the Candy House most recently, but won the Pulitzer Prize for a visit from the Goon Squad, and her she has a huge following. So when she posted our interview there, I all of a sudden on the social media for the, for the podcast got, I went from having like a hundred followers all of a sudden to 300 overnight. And so there was a big exponential gain. The other one was joining my, the podcast is part of a, a consortium of yeah. academically leaning podcasts called the New Books Network. And that is really the the engine that fueled having more listeners was becoming part of that. And they have partner, uh, they both have in-house things that they produce. So they produce a ton of uh, of interviews with academics about their academic books in-house. But then they have partner websites that do different things. And we're one of the partner websites. Did and you so partner with them? After several episodes or from the beginning? No, I, it was after t almost two years. And oh. I think I think you had to have a, a certain number of listeners and have an established audience and community before you could partner with them. And so, but that really was the, the guy who runs it, Marshall Poe, is he's tireless and he advocates for all of his podcasts. And so I get a lot of extra advertisement and listenership just by the very fact that he's constantly putting out great podcasts and people get you know you get in a list of podcasts and find new listeners so he's, okay. he's part of that and the lessons you've learned the lessons i've learned uh well a lot of humility because early on you know having so so many kind of problems with audio one of 
my favorite interviews I've ever done is exists and I think it still is a great interview but I really messed up the audio of the author Kevin Wilson who's one of my favorite American authors and and I only got to interview him because a friend of mine from graduate school is in the same department that he's in so I didn't have to reach out to his publicist or anything I had a sort of inside line and we had this magnificent conversation and he was so open and vulnerable and kind and and then I listened to it and and he just had this very it made his voice sound really funny. And because oh. he's he's a kind person, he didn't say anything but that he liked the interview and, and thought it was good. But you have to have a little bit of humility because sometimes even now when I'm better at the basics of it, I'll I'll screw something up and something won't sound quite right, or I'll there'll be background noise that's annoying enough that I'll lose an answer to a question that was really the best answer. And I never want to go back to the author and say, oh, re-record this one answer. So I learned a lot of humility. I learned that way, way, way more people than I ever thought listen to podcasts about books. I didn't even really listen to many podcasts about books before I started <laughs> one, maybe one, which I didn't listen to very often. But I think, you know, the, the story that books are less important to the world is a false story. And I think <laughs> there are um, just enormous readers and fans of thinking about and talking about books. And that is, I, boy, I'm hopeful because there are that many people who will go out and listen to a podcast about books. By the way, are your kids good readers? Do they love books? Are they, have they been burned by books like you? You know, that's a great question. They definitely read. And, you know, some of their reading is, is school-based. And some, my younger son, I still read to every night and he reads on his own and he's like Maya um, in that I think he prefers to be to be read to because of <laughs> as you say it's a social thing you share a story together you know I do pretty good voices so uh, but you know the older one I, I think has been burned by very particular books Mm -hmm. And so there are books that, you know, he remembers and kind of keeps them, you know, in his soul. He loves them so much. But I don't know that he's like burning through a million books a year. He's busy. He's a busy guy. I stopped early on thinking that I could make them into little clone readers of myself <laughs> and just let them love the things they love and, and hope that as adults that they see books as something that you know, can give them good company, project them into the lives of people that they might otherwise not know or, mm -hmm. or understand, and perhaps even give them a little more empathy about people in the world. Mm -hmm. What about your wife? She reads more than, than I do. She really? A, and part of her reading is audiobooks because she's got to commute to mm -hmm. work every day, but she reads she reads considerably more than I do. She reads the same in, in print, but then she also listens to kind of constant audiobooks. So she's a good recommender for me. She'll say, you've got to read this one, this one, this one. She also reads totally different genres for me a lot. She loves mysteries and and espionage and spy thrillers and you know and romanticals and things that aren't necessarily the first things that I read but she'll recommend ones and they're always great. Have you read books at the same time like the same book at the same time? Very rarely mm -hmm. it's usually one of us will read one and you know and and recommend it to the other person i think there's been a couple of times where we've both been so excited for a book that we both got i remember when uh haruki murakami the japanese author when he had a long time when he hadn't had a book come out and then he had this massive massive book come out called 1q84 and i think we at that point both got both got copies and, and read it at the same time. Very nice. Um, what's next for you 
in this adventure? You know, what's next is trying to kind of, as I said, find new authors that maybe are less, less available because of how publishing works and maybe are with smaller presses, maybe authors who are having um, debuts that are really critically acclaimed but aren't getting enough publicity for various reasons and to try and give them a um, give them a, a place on the podcast to be able to talk about their work and also to find a nice balance for myself of a number of episodes that feel healthy with my job with my family life and my friends this year was a lot um, a lot a lot a lot of episodes and it at times was a little bit um, too much and so trying to find a way that I can have a healthy relationship with it. And is this an adventure that um, has a, a limit, has an end date, or is you're going to discover it as you go? I don't. Right now, I can't imagine letting it go because it feels so important to me. It has a it now has a kind of engine of its own in that, you know, people reach out about interviews and I, I don't like to say no, I like to say yes, <laughs> going with the theme of this podcast. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel like that for now anyway, it's fun. I, I love it. It feeds my reading habit. I, for the most part, these authors have been such lovely people. There's been mm -hmm. really the rare person who I wouldn't want to meet in real life. The rest of them, I would wish I were their friends. I wish I saw them socially. They're so nice and smart and interesting. <laughs> and so I see it going on for, for a while, at least, until, until the audience is done with it. And then it's back to maybe just, you know, recording for my family. When you publish your book, Who's going to interview you for your podcast? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. You have to choose one of these writers that you so en enjoy so much to interview you for your own podcast. That's a great idea. I, I'll have <laughs> one who is a really great uh, um, interviewee and who I think would ask great questions, which I'm sure a lot of them would, but I love that idea. Yep. Um, before I let you go, as you saw in um, the text that my brother Hector wrote, our life is about yeses and nos. The nos define us, define the limits of who we are. Um, the yeses are important to expand these fences that we set to define our identities. So we've talk talked about this big yes that you had um, creating your podcast. But now I'm curious to know, when was a time in your life when saying no was a better option? Yeah, and this is, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this because I agree, I, I agree with Hector's sentiments so much that you do, we, we give ourselves limits that help define ourselves and and allow us to make yeses in ways that are more uh, meaningful to us when we can when we can say nos and you know it's been for me i've had a long uh difficult and and relationship with my biological father and I'm trying to decide whether you know, it was a relationship that should continue for me was, you know, has been one of the hardest things that I've ever had to deal with. And, you know, recently we got in contact again and I was, and, and I thought maybe I was interested in, in having him back in my life, but, you know, because of the way that conversation went and, and the way in which he wanted to have everything on his terms and wasn't really interested in, in me as a full person who had, who needed to have no's and yeses of my own, not totally dominated by him, I decided that that was not a healthy relationship for me. And so it's a, you know, it was a deeply 
painful decision, but it was one that I think allows me to make the kinds of decisions about when to say yes to things in my life that are truer to me. And so that, I, I think it was a profoundly important no. Wow. That's, I'm sorry, but I'm also proud of you that, I mean, it's not, it's not easy to make those kinds of decisions. I no, think of, I think of my own father with his relationship with his father and how at some point he just decided that it wasn't good for him or for any of us. Um, to have a relationship with him. Um, but it's also a decision that I guess I can feel that made him the father he was or he is to us. It was a very important decision that defined him in a very important way. So I'm hoping from and moving forward, it makes you also feel better. I mean, I would, I, I, part of my decision absolutely had to do with the effect that it would have on my, on my kids so that I, I hope I follow in your, your father's footsteps and in, in having it be a good decision. Hopefully. Well, Chris, this has been lovely. I'm so honored that you said yes to um, coming to this YouTube channel and uh, I'm honored. My yes, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'm very honored to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good luck with your podcast. Um, actually, uh, just last weekend, no, the previous weekend, Carlos was in New York City with my niece, uh, Valentina. Valentina, who's mentioned in Hector's uh, text. Mm. And a friend of Valentina came over, Sarah, and for some reason in part of their conversation, Carlos said, oh, I have a podcast that would be perfect for you. <laughs> so he recommended your oh. podcast to Sarah, Valentina's friend. That's it's so coming nice. full circle, see? <laughs> I'm gonna have to like go over to Carlos's office and like <laughs> give him, you know, gifts for, <laughs> for promoting me. <laughs> She's a college student, so I don't know what are the ages of your audience. Do you know what's the range? Yeah, it really is sort of college to, you know, 80 or 90. Or 90. Okay. Uh, so it, it starts around the college age for me. Well, you'll have one more college student listening to your podcast. <laughs> and um, last thing that I need to ask you is um, I finished these videos with photographs of um, things that we talked about. So if you have a picture of when you were a kid reading a book, if you have a picture of that book that you that uh, burned you at eight years, eight, <laughs> nine years old, that would be perfect. If you have any any visuals that uh, we can add at the end of this video would be lovely. Uh, we have not mentioned that you have a website and you have Twitter and Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. tell us about that before I let you go. So uh, the website is burnedbybooks.com and then the Instagram is burnedbybooks1. Uh, and the Twitter is burned by books. Why one? Why the one? There's, an, to there's another burned by books that is a <laughs> non. It's a non-active uh, site, but they got there first. Oh, okay. Well, um, and one question that I forgot to ask you. That's the last one. Um, do you read in other languages? I uh, used to read in Japanese, and mm -hmm. I can I can still read in in French because I had to train in that for my PhD. Mm -hmm. But I am now starting to read in in Spanish I, after you know living in Spain for a little bit and becoming uh, obsessed with 
uh, Central and South American writers. I'm trying to read. It's very slow going, uh, but I that's a that's a goal for me down the road is to hopefully read things in in the original in Spanish. Very nice. Well, now I will let you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're you. a wonderful human being. I love what you do. Um, I'm honored to be your friend and um, good luck with your podcast and whatever comes your way. I'm hoping that one day I can see an interview of you with your favorite author. Oh, and the same way you finish your interviews, tell us what you have on your nightstand. What are you reading oh, right now? I am <laughs> reading... Um... I'm reading some great books right now. I'm reading uh, a book by Daisy Florin called My Last Year of Innocence. And uh, I'm reading a, um, a South Asian, an Indian sort of adventure gangster um, crime novel called The Age of Vice uh, by Deepti Kapoor. And I am reading uh, a, a memoir, um, a emotionally just so powerful memoir called Stay True by Hua Su. Okay. If you can send me a picture of the books on your nightstand. <laughs> we got also at it. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much again. And bye, Chris. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>